talking about cognitive uh, impairments and talking about mm -hmm. maybe difficulty in recall and memory and that sort of thing. But there's another part of this that I think is particularly important and is a good lead in to talking about why you feel that law enforcement particularly needs to become aware of this. Mm -hmm. And that is the um, psychosocial, behavioral, or emotional kind of impairments that uh, people may have as a result that may happen long term. And um, again, we may not be connecting them to the injury. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at what some of those might look like. Let's see, we've got fatigue, uh, denial and anxiety, mood swings, self-centeredness, that's an interesting one, we'll get back to that, and depression, lowered self-esteem, maybe some sexual dysfunction, restlessness, uh, difficult emotional control, and inability to cope. Okay, so it looks like, um, in general, <clears throat> that, you know, this, is, this may be somebody who looks pretty emotionally labile. I mean, you know, one, they may have a good day today, tomorrow it may be difficult mm -hmm. for them. I guess a lot of people you've worked with over time have probably received a myriad of diagnosis depending on, on what phase they went to counseling. Is that true? Uh, correct. Um, actually, if they're, they're young and in the school system, they may often be diagnosed with a learning disability or attention deficit disorder, which also okay. may or may not be part of their makeup. But if you find out that they were in a car crash at age five or six, and you know, you sometimes wonder, you know, is that behavior that you're seeing due to um, consequences of brain injury or due to trauma or other contributing factors? And sometimes you don't, you only need to know it when you're looking at the treatment protocol that you're going to use. Okay. And that's where you really, um, that's where progress is made for the individual if they get matched to the right protocol. Well, see, and that, that's what I was thinking because it's kind of like uh, one of the things I tell my clients when they come into counseling is I want you to have a medical physical mm -hmm. because I do not want to treat diabetes with therapy. Mm -hmm. That does, you know, well, you won't get better and this, this doesn't work. So it would seem that you need to do some ruling out. Do you send people to neurologists to help you with your diagnosis? Um, my, my experience um, is with the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. I find that usually the field of uh, physical medicine and rehab um, have that comprehensive approach to looking at the individual. Um, if indeed somebody um, has a seizure disorder that requires further management, they may um, consult with neurology. Um, if an individual needs, um, because of motor, some motor component uh, to work with uh, orthopedics, they'll refer to, um, to that department or that specialty area. But in physical medicine and rehabilitation, the philosophy about rehabilitation is, is not always attached to a fix and a cure, but the, what has to happen to restore function, not just physical function, but cognitive function. Okay. And they're more used to working in a team approach, working with occupational therapists, physical therapists, neuropsychologists, you know, That's outside persons. And yeah. so people tend to come out from that kind of evaluation with more awareness about what their strengths and limitations are and a better shot at being matched to the protocols that are going to teach them the strategies they may need to get through the day or to master activities. Okay, so that's called the Department of Physical Medicine physical and medicine. Rehabilitation, um, rehab docs, um, physiatrists, okay. physiatry is the specialty area, that's another term always used nowadays, but okay. rehab medicine and, uh, and actually, um, you know, we're very, we have rehab medicine specialists in private practice, we have them on staff at our major trauma centers, um, and we have a, actually we're, we're very lucky on the west coast, we have a a federally funded um, uh, TBI project at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center where they do have a model program for both inpatient and outpatient rehabilitation for traumatic brain injury. Can somebody receive uh, this kind of treatment if their injury happened again when they're 10 and maybe they're 30 years old now? What usually happens um, on an outpatient basis is um, a physician will look at what the individual's complaints are both physical as well as functional. What does a person really want to do? Are they have where are they having difficulty in their life? 
Are they having difficulty maintaining a job? Are they having difficulty um, staying sober or getting through an academic program? Um, if, if the goals seem to be feasible, then usually the physician can, can uh, may order neuropsychological testing or speech therapy or speech consult to look at um, you know, really what are the, the problem areas where the person is, is having difficulty and then looking at the, what has to happen to um, teach the individual other strategies. Now, is this expensive? I mean, it sounds like well, you're, you're dropping a lot of yeah. um, physician and specialty names here. I guess I have some concern about referral. I mean, um, it's, is it expensive? Um, Certainly, um, the evaluation and treatments available um, to individuals, regardless of their um, ability to pay, if they're um, using, for example, a county public hospital like at Santa Clara okay. Valley Medical Center. In the days of managed care, though, I must say that um, if people have uh, limitations in their insurance policies with regard to rehabilitation services, which is more the trend now, um, it's it's more of a challenge for people to get really the, the, the frequency of the contacts they might need to sustain them. But that's where the community plays a role. There's more and more of a need for community agencies like our community college systems or other org agencies um, who are developing other rehabilitation programs okay. that are community-based. Okay. more affordable to work on the cognitive uh, retraining so maybe move issues. So you move it out of just kind of a medical facility where overhead's higher and paying people's time is more to a community mm -hmm. system where maybe we could do it um, more cost effectively. Well, in, in the medical role's primary, pl um, their, their place is to come up with, a, with good baseline data okay. and then to move the person really back into the community where you know, rehabilitation is a process. There's a beginning and there's an end. It's fluid, uh, and it varies from person to person. And uh, and so the community really is um, trying to mobilize itself in order to provide the the correct environments and to prof and professionals that understand the nature of the injury. Um, the the challenge there is a lot of these programs are underfunded or not funded, and it's for this population and that's the challenge is trying to move the dollars into the community resources okay. um, so that there's more parity across the disability groups. Okay. Well, that is a marvelous segue to the work you're doing in terms of um, working with the law enforcement community and wanting to um, at least increase awareness in that particular um, group of individuals mm -hmm. about the need for services and specialized um, identification. Um, one of the things I wanted to do was to read uh, a letter that you had given me from uh, one of the parents of, of a client of yours who I believe was, um, who was unfortunately shot and killed in an encounter with Correct. the police. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought this probably speaks more than anything to uh, your mission with this. And this is from, I believe, his father. Mm -hmm. He says, my name is Isaac Arubalakava. Six years ago, my son sustained a traumatic brain injury. Six months ago, he was shot because of the lack of education, prevention, and training on disabilities by all law enforcement personnel, especially police, probation, and correctional officers. We called 911 for help to restrain our son or to be talked down to calm him. We did not expect Lance to be shot and killed. Due to the lack of training about TBI and its, as its uh, effects on a person, that police officer was also a victim. I believe that if uh, the officer had been trained and informed about TBI, he would have used better judgment. I also believe that he too is going through a lot of pain because he killed my son. I saw the terror in his eyes after he shot Lance and he remained frozen with his weapon drawn. For a second, I thought he was going to shoot me. Legislation must be enacted to inform and educate all law enforcement personnel about the disability-related behavior on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Okay, now this was, uh, when, 1993? 93. 93. Believe, yeah. This was a few years ago. Yeah. And uh, I can tell by expression on your face, this was uh, something that mm -hmm. continues to touch you. Mm -hmm. And it may be part of the reason you're such an activist on this. Mm -hmm. How, um, 
since that period of time, I know the, uh, the Brain Injury Association has been trying to get this looked at at a countywide and statewide level. What is happening at this point in Santa Clara mm -hmm. County uh, in terms of working with the correctional officers? Santa Clara County actually is leading the way in one, not only recognizing the need for the education for their um, personnel, but also providing the opportunities um, for uh, the training. And uh, since, um, uh, since Mr. Rubikava and I testified in Sacramento at a legislative hearing, um, what has occurred now is that uh, there is a curriculum in the uh, mandated, mandated training for law enforcement officers in California at both the academy level and for advanced officers training. Um, there is um, uh, educational material, video, workbook. Um, there are trained um, civilians as well as law enforcement personnel that are certified to provide this training. And, um, and, and I'll include myself in that at this point. Uh, the California Commission for Peace Officers Standards and Training is the agency responsible for um, having the material available to any law enforcement agency at no cost. And when there is a request to put together uh, in-service training, uh, they may um, ask for people with my background to provide it, working in partnership with somebody from law enforcement so that we're communicating information that is vital to keep both the um, officers safe as well as citizens safe. You know, there's more and more people with disabilities in our communities. And everyone has their own um, sense of identity about what being disabled means. Quite often people with traumatic brain injury may be um, viewed as being um, having a mental illness because there is a behavioral component that can mirror behaviors associated with mental illness. Um, sometimes they may have problems with um, their memory and so they may be perceived as having a developmental disability um, such as mental retardation. Quite often there's, you know, there's assumptions that are placed um, uh, about people with disabilities and actually there had not been any training material about traumatic brain injury specifically um, because they thought it was being taken care of in these other communities. So now that there is, uh, we're looking forward to expanding the opportunities throughout California. Okay. I need to break at this point and uh, I wish we could talk further, but um, I appreciate you coming oh, and welcome. making time to, to share this important issue with us. And thank you for tuning in. Next week, we will explore internet addiction. So log off and tune in then. I'm Mary Crocker Cook. Good night. For topic suggestions, write to Bay Area Psychology at 1723 Hamilton Avenue, Suite A, San Jose, California, 95120.